Welcome to the On Purpose Podcast, where together we will learn from personal stories and explore thought-provoking topics, all with one goal in mind, living a more purposeful life. Welcome to episode 201 of the On Purpose Podcast. As always, it's a blessing and an honor to show up this week and to meet you wherever you are and to continue to deliver you purposeful, inspiring, thought-provoking content. And want to ask before we get started with this week's guest that you pay your bill, like, subscribe, share the podcast, and join us on Patreon where you can pick a membership that fits your budgetary options and contribute financially to helping us grow to become the most impactful podcast in the world. And uh, without your support, without the support of the Patreons that before you, we couldn't have made it into year four, and I'm excited where we're going, and I'm pumped to have you along the journey. So join us on Patreon backslash the On Purpose Podcast, and join the team there. All right, this week's guest is somebody that I've known for a couple years, met him on LinkedIn, we've connected a few times, he's uh, got a law enforcement background like myself, and he's recently retired and jumped into private industry with his mission to inspire all people to be powerful negotiators. He takes his crisis negotiation skills and shares with you all how they can work in day-to-day conversations. And uh, it's a very insightful, fun conversation I was glad to have. And, and this week, I hope you enjoy listening to Scott Telema. And as always, thanks for being here. Enjoy the interview. Scott, welcome to the show, and it's a pleasure to have you joining the On Purpose Podcast, my friend. Hey, Jared, how are you? Happy to be here. It's good, man. It's good. It feels like it's been a long time coming, getting you on the show and watching your career. I know we kind of had to wait until you wanted to retire and freed up some time, so congratulations on that big life uh, change. Yeah, it's quite the transition. Uh, I've finished over 20 years in law enforcement in the Chicago area, and uh, I've decided to step away from the full-time work at that agency so I could focus on running my own business and being a speaker, teacher, trainer, and bringing my knowledge and passion for negotiations and influence across the country and around the world. How did uh, the family take the news when you told them you wanted to go pursue this route? I think that with any change, there's always a bit of concern because we are moving away from a very certain paycheck that's always on time to a uh, much different environment. So now I'm having to work for a living. I have to earn my money. So there's, there's always a concern of loss, but I really see it very differently. I see this as an opportunity to serve more people, to reach more people and uh, to provide more for my family. So I, I see this as a very exciting opportunity to still contribute to the law enforcement community but to also bring some of this to leaders and people across the world who are interested in this type of work. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love it. What was your, uh, when your wife gave you that look of like, I don't know about this, what was your go-to argument on why this is absolutely going to work, Scott? See, I just asked her questions. Instead of selling like any good (laughs) negotiator, instead of selling your position, I just start asking questions. You know, what are your concerns? What are you feeling? What are you thinking about when you ask this question? And I ask her a whole bunch of good questions, and then we have a real dialogue about it. So instead of selling, ask good questions. That's my first good piece of advice for anybody <laughs> out there who's under the gun. Oh, that's funny, yeah. Well, because we had similar backgrounds, and we made the leap from law enforcement to to going into consulting and podcasting and total creative stuff, which is way outside my my element initially. And uh, I didn't ask all the questions, Scott. I got to believe I failed in that negotiation tactic because I just overstated my position and made promises that I wasn't sure I could keep, but I, I but I was pretty sure. That's all right. We're trying, right? We're doing our best. And the cool thing is when you bet on yourself and believe in yourself, you become unstoppable. There's no ceiling there. There's nothing holding me back. And I know you're the same way. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Thankfully, belief has got me pretty far and we'll, we'll continue to do it. But that it's awesome, Scott. But before we get into any more tips for our community, I gotta warm you up. I gotta kind of ease you into this and let the on purpose podcast know the real important parts of Scott before we get to that message. All right, warm me up, my friend. Here we go. 
All right, here you go, my friend. Number one, Scott, you are stranded on a deserted island for the rest of your life. What food are you going to be eating? This is cool because my friends and my family have already answered this question as they're listening in right now. I'm going to go with the Mexican pizza from Taco Bell. A close second might be Pequod's Pizza here in uh, the Chicago area. They are awesome. And maybe a third or another close second would be a Portillo's Big Beef Italian Sandwich. Uh, uh, the Italian beef is awesome with some hot peppers. But if you have to pin me to one, it's going to be Taco Bell, and it will be the Mexican pizza. Taco Bell. I got to tell you, Scott, I almost can't go to question two on that answer. I got to ponder for me. I've never heard Taco Bell come up in this answer authentic mexican it's delightful <laughs> 201 episodes is the first time we've gotten to taco bell so good thing they're not a sponsor to show scott they will be once they hear this they will be <laughs> just wait for mexican it. mexican pizza all right you have a superpower what would it be and why do you want it oh i want to fly i love airplanes love watching airplane videos i think if i could go back maybe i'd be a pilot i'd, I'd consider going to flight school or something like this. But if I could have a superpower, it would be that I could just lift up and, and fly as a person. And I think that it's very liberating and, and very cool to have that freedom. Yeah, for sure. What is uh, your favorite book or your go-to book when you just need to, to get the mind right? Man, there are so many great books and, and a lot of them uh, on my shelf are around negotiation, but, uh, I would say if you pin me down to one, it's going to be Hostage at the Table by uh, Professor George Kohlreiser. He's a, a professor of leadership at IMD Business School in Switzerland, psychologist, uh, former hostage negotiator. And he's got a great, great leadership program that he teaches. Uh, and his book, Hostage at the Table, really draws on his background from psychology and negotiation and really makes a metaphor that we are not going to be held hostage to anyone or anything brings in elements of bonding and uh, the impact loss has on us and grief and trauma and uh, really important for negotiators to understand these things if they want to be influential in their work. But my book is going to be Hostage at the Table by George Cole Reiser. I love it. All right. You get dinner with one person. They can still either be with us or may have passed on. Who would you have dinner with and what would you ask them? Mm -hmm. I think in the context of the on purpose podcast, uh, you know, the people who are coming to mind are, are those who are really principled people who are driven by a purpose. And I, one character that comes to mind is, is going to be Abraham Lincoln. And I'm what I'm thinking in relation to our discussion on purpose is he really made some principled decisions as an early president of the United States. And one of them is to, free the slaves and unify the country. And it would be really interesting. And, and I would suppose that we could guess his reason for doing so, but I would be interested in hearing what he thought that impact might be and how he envisioned some of his decisions and how they might influence the country. Because really at that time, we're at a point where we're looking at potentially two totally separate countries driven by different values and different ideals. Yeah. And uh, clearly in 2023, the U.S. is far from perfect. We have a long way to go in a variety of different areas. But that is such a such an impactful decision. Um, and his leadership during the Civil War was so impactful. I would love to have all kinds of uh, questions with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. We we still have a long way to go. And I think sometimes we get focused, over, overly focused on how far we got to go. And it's nice to always stop for a minute and look back and see how far we've come so that we, we kind of have a barometer of we're making progress, if we're, if we're conscious about it and we're moving towards it. So, Scott, I want to well, – congratulations on retiring from law enforcement. I want to ask you before we get into what you're doing today, at what point – in your career, did you know that you could take the talents and the skills that that you had developed there and you could bet on yourself and go private with it? I think a big turning point was in late 2016. It was 
um, either in late summer or early fall, I had uh, a gentleman reach out to me and asked if I would be interested in taking my knowledge, education, experience around my work as a hostage and crisis negotiator and sharing that with the broader world uh, on a TEDx conference in the Chicago area. And he explained it was only seven weeks away, so this is going to have to be a very, very quick decision and preparation to make this happen. Um, but, you know, like any good opportunity, it's tough to say no. And even though you may have a little bit of fear or a little anxiety, when you got an opportunity to do something big, you need to say yes to these and really prepare and work to rise to that occasion to make it everything that it can be. So it was this decision to agree to give a, a TED talk that really moved me from a very sheltered, I'm in this law enforcement world to a much more broad community of people who are saying the, these principles of influence, these techniques of bonding and connection and listening, I could really use that in my work. And I was hearing that from people um, across the world in different lines of work than I've ever been part of and very validating for them to say, I think this is going to be useful for me and my business, for me and the team that I lead. And to hear their stories on how they're using my work to benefit them. And it was probably in the years following, because this was published on YouTube and it's been seen a few times, that I begin these conversations with these different people and learn that what we've been doing can bring value to people of all different backgrounds. I love what was the what's been the biggest industry outside of law enforcement that, that you've established your presence and that kind of surprised you that you you would have had no idea the skill skills you had correlated to that that world you know, we do a lot of work with leaders a lot around leadership i'm very lucky to get to be part of a, a class called advanced high performance leadership uh, in europe a few times a year to work with leaders from across the world and uh, what an exciting thing to be able to bring to them additional tools for people who are already exceptional at this type of thing, bring additional tools, additional confidence to their work. But, you know, we hear from people in sales, in marketing, anybody who wants to get people moving in their direction, customer service representatives, all these people who are having to deal with folks who may not be very happy to see them. How do we deescalate? How do we use these tools? So it's really expanded to a whole variety of of different fields that we're serving in my work today. Yeah. How do we, so we're on the same page and that, that we both took the skills we developed within the law enforcement profession and said, wait a second, I, I think I can do this on my own. And there's a demand for it. We've both made that step. How do we get more police officers to recognize the, the skills and the talents they possess so that they see opportunities outside of the career field should they want to take them? I think that's going to be happening largely because most of the agencies in the United States are having higher standards of hiring for police officers. So I think that gone are the days of the 30, 35, 40 year career police officer. You're now demanding people come in with higher levels of education that get um, that score better or pass these psychological exams, have cleaner backgrounds, really a high level of professionals for a lot of agencies across the country. And they're going to realize that they do have the talent, skills, and ability to work outside of law enforcement. And a lot of these folks may not even get to their retirement age to where they might be able to lock in a pension uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think that we are drafting more talented, more skilled people into the profession and really people who are driven. You can't just show up and do this job anymore. You need to really have a purpose and a heart of service because it's not an easy job and it's not getting any easier. So I think that we're going to have a, a shift to this being a much shorter career span than it has been historically. And a lot of these folks are going to realize there are opportunities for them across the board. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good perspective. So then how is a culture, because law enforcement, I, I'm guessing you would probably agree, law enforcement is a culture is slow to adapt to change. 
right? Very we, much. What do they say? Cops, the two things they hate is things staying the same and change. That's us. <laughs> right. Like we don't. So how then, how as an industry can we adapt to that new trend and not, because I hear this all the time, right? Like, oh, this generation, that, that generation, this, like we're always looking backwards towards our generation. So how do we get leaders within law enforcement to embrace the fact they may only have ultra talented people for 10 to 20 years instead of 30 or 40 and to embrace that they're going to want more both within and outside the career. How do we change that mindset that that's a negative thing? The thing that we start using the resources in the right places, and that's going to encourage the leadership to say, now you have a person motivated to do the job because they're in the place that they want to be, not only getting the right people on the bus, but putting them in the right seats on that bus and allowing people to pursue their passions, to say law enforcement is very broad. That's why it's such a challenging question for the new candidates to say, why do you want to be the police or why do you want to be a police officer? And the question is challenging because it's such a broad profession. We can be doing things from a a school resource officer dealing with young juveniles to being a sniper on the SWAT team versus a, a traffic enforcement officer to a, to a canine. There's so many different specialties within the field. Why not encourage people to say, find your calling. Yeah. Where is it you want to be? And we're going to support you to get the training and education to get there. And once you become good at it, we are going to push you to become great at it and be the leader in this field rather than being stuck to this old mindset of, well, you've done this job for four years. Now we're going to cycle somebody else and let them be a detective. Now we're going <laughs> to let the next person do this. And I mean, yeah. what in the world yeah. are we thinking? We demand that people or encourage people go out and become good at something. And we let you do it for a couple of years and say, okay, now somebody else is going to do it because we're, we're continuing in, in an idea yeah. of developing everybody else or some kind of fairness, but it, it's very discouraging to those who are yeah. good at something or want to be good at something and then told, well, you're not going to be able to do that. So I think it, it's going to drive more engagement if we can get the right people in the right places and let the leadership see that level of engagement go up and that connection go up and value to that agency go up and continue to nourish those relationships and make sure we're treating them like real people to appreciate yeah. that they're not just pawns to help us do more. And this goes for any industry yep. and any agency that these are real people and make sure that we have strong bonds of leadership with them to say, how are you? How are things here at home? And make sure that they feel valued and connected to the organization because as soon as they lose that, they're drifting away and you can wave goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the biggest shift in generations and in generational attitude. And I think it's actually for the better of humanity and society is that, you know, like our parents' generation they always said you were lucky to have a job and you just go to work and you put up with it and someday you'll be able to retire if you're lucky and you just deal with it. Whereas now they question like, wait a second, this doesn't feel right to me. I don't feel valued here. It seems like I'm not important. I'm going to go look somewhere else. And, and I, I 100 percent agree with you. That is a mindset that we have to change within law enforcement and general corporations around the world is people want to be valued. And if they're not, they're going to go find somebody else that makes them feel valued or they're going to create their own. For sure. When we teach what drives human behavior, one of the pieces we talk about is recognition that especially with this younger generation um, and not just young people, but younger generation. Yeah. They've all got their own social media accounts. I mean, it's it's very individualistic versus how it used to be prior to that. And are people getting the recognition that they're hoping for that they're used to getting? And uh, it was interesting. I, I heard or read somewhere that uh, Oprah Winfrey, who has interviewed tens of thousands of people from the, the president to the very normal lay person. And she was asked, you know, what do all these people that you've interviewed, what do they have in common? And she talks about, they always wrap up the interview and ask, you know, how was it? How did I do? Was that okay? And really what they are seeking here is this validation, this recognition that what they just contributed is somehow valuable or acceptable. 
And if we're not seeing the need for that and providing recognition, not only providing it, but giving it in the way that the person wants that recognition, right. if we're not meeting that, we are really falling short of the basic needs of somebody in their job, in their role or in their function. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and a lot of times old school people tied into pay and money, which is always nice, but study after study shows just what you're saying. People just want to know that what they're doing is important and that you see it. It doesn't necessarily have to have a monetary benefit. I'm with you. So talk to me. So besides the security of pay, when you were deciding to retire and, and take this venture out, what was your biggest fear or obstacle you had to overcome to even get the momentum going forward? I think moving the mindset from this is a side job and this is a hobby, something that I'm doing for fun into an idea of I am now running a business and uh, I'm not running a charity. My my need in doing this is to support myself and support my family. So there is so much that I needed to learn. And everybody who's in law enforcement, we we have the confidence that we're very good at our job. And most of us are quite good at our job, but we have to have the humility of realizing there is so much I don't know about running a business from the accounting to the business development, to the marketing. I mean, things yeah. don't just show up. Nobody is so great that people are just knocking on our door, um, you know, without having some reason to do so. So I think the the biggest hurdle was how do I actually run a business? And I had five roommates in undergrad at the University of Wisconsin, and all of them were business school students. And I didn't take one business class. And how are we expecting people to be successful in life if we're not teaching them finance 101, if we're not teaching them some of these basic life skill things that should be expected for all college graduates. So I wish that I had some of that education and background. Um, but you know, luckily, I, I've got a great network. I've got uh, a very talented business partner that I work with to help me in areas where I need to learn and grow. Um, so it's not just good enough to say, hey, I'm good at this new thing. You have to be a competent to actually sustain it as a uh, job and, and provide income for yourself and your family. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's definitely a humbling path. And, and I'll tell you the one that got me by surprise, because I did some research and part of it, I just leaped was uh, nobody ever told me about global pandemics. <laughs> there was no class on how you handle that as a business. It's in the way a little bit, right? Yeah, it'll, it'll deviate even the most thought out and well-planned business models. Yeah, I remember this and, and I was still kind of doing the speaking, teaching and training as a, a hobby back then. But I am sure I was quoted on a podcast somewhere as saying, I am a virtual holdout. I am not going to be doing virtual training or virtual keynotes. I'm going to wait this out. Um, because as you mentioned earlier, I'm one of those people that subscribe to change is bad and scary and we don't like change. Right. And now uh, I've got, you know, the, the nice cameras, the professional microphones, I got studio curtains. I'm looking at a huge TV in front of me. I've got everything you need to have virtual broadcasting. I, I would never have to leave the office. Uh, and it takes a while to get your head around, Hey, how are we going to adapt which we should be very good at, and, and a lot of us are. Um, but that put me behind a little bit to be able and willing to adapt. And it, it happens all the time right now. I mean, we're there's an emergence of chat GPT right now, which is all the rage over maybe the last couple of weeks or the last month. And it would be wild to tune into this, uh, this episode in two years, let's say January of 2025, and learn how uh, a function like this is changing the world or not changing the world and are we aware of what's happening around us and are we jumping in and uh, and giving it a try and being thought leaders to say well just because it's always been done this way doesn't necessarily mean it continues to be the right path forward 10 20 30 years later oh my goodness the whole ai and automated this I, I, honestly scott that blows my buffer some days when i look at all the things I may not have to do in the future. Yeah. And, you know, I look at some of this stuff and my, 
my initial thought, uh, without getting too deep in, into this AI world, is <laughs> I'm very impressed by what I'm seeing. Very impressed by the these chat functions and, and these uh, intelligence systems out here. Um, but there's a credibility piece that as soon as somebody realizes that this is not you, this is not your words, this is not your emotion with it, there, there's a big credibility loss. And the buy-in you think you have is largely associated with the bonds and connections that we have with right. real people, other real people. Um, but I think that there's going to be a, a segment of the population that's going to be really okay with this. Just to say, I know this isn't a real person, but I'm hearing the things I want to hear. Uh, I'm being told all the right things. And and there there's going to be people falling in love and, and really having deep emotional connections with these artificial intelligence machines. <laughs> it's going to, it's going to get wonky. I mean, things are really going to get weird with this. Uh, I, I, and I've had conversations with some friends of mine that are ultra creative uh, that think it's a fantastic idea, but I always go back to Scott. I've never seen another creature on earth that seems so hell bound on making themselves obsolete like humans. How about it? We're we're funny that way. I think it's because it's it's nice to be lazy. If I can have somebody else do all my stuff and all that, why not? Right. But then you know what's our role? What's our purpose? What's yeah. our function? I don't know what that I don't know what I would do if I took away all the things I normally do. Like, but my friend says I'd be more creative and I'd be able to make music and do all the stuff that I can't do because my day-to-day -day life doesn't allow it. And I'm just like, I don't know, man. I, I might get lazy too. I might just sit around and do nothing. Wait, call me up when we're doing that. I'll join you for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we'll get together, do nothing. All right, I, I want to, um, let's pivot a little bit. I love the secrets of hostage negotiators, and I love the practical steps you're using to break down such a complex topic so that it kind of meets your mission statement, which is to inspire people of all backgrounds to be powerful negotiators. So, Talk to us about that program and, and how you identified these key steps to be successful in communication. Yeah, for, for me, um, and to share this with your audience, the, the four principles that I think are most important to the work of hostage and or crisis negotiation um, are understanding, timing, delivery, and respect. And uh, the principles behind that is we always work to understand the situation. We need to know when to deliver the message. Um, it's not so much what we say, but how we say it. And we have to know the power of respect. And none of those four things should be groundbreaking or new to anybody. But the the way that we use them together, um, I don't see them like a stairway. Um, I see them forming a circle. So not only do we need to know what these principles are, but we need to know how they work together. And for me, it's so important what we see. And in the field of behavioral economics, they talk about, they even go as far as to say what you see is all there is. So it's important that we get the visual correct first, that these principles, it's not a straight line, it's not a stairs, we're going around a circle and we're just touching on each one of these as we go. And for me, that circle represents the bond that we're trying to create with the person that we are speaking with. And after having done this type of work for a while and having my education is in psychology and behavioral science, um, I found that these are the most important principles that get us through these difficult conversations. And by having a structure and a strategy, these difficult conversations are no longer something that we need to fear, but rather a tremendous opportunity for us to find success. And it's it's so much fun to not only teach this cognitively, but to teach the ability and the skills. And reality-based training is becoming mandated, at least in my state here in Illinois, um, for police training moving forward. And, you know, that's exciting and all, but we've been doing that. We've been yeah. doing reality-based training for many, many years. So I can't imagine for anybody that this is new to them. Um, but when we run these scenarios and one particular scenario, um, we it's, it's the bad day scenario. The officer is looking for uh, a suicidal subject and they come across a person in a car that kind of matches this description. And I role play it where I jump out and I've got a knife to my throat. And of course it, 
it begins with um, tactics to make sure that their tactics are correct. But as soon as we identify they've got that down, it immediately falls into a crisis negotiation. And it's so interesting to watch them work because particularly these new folks, they've been taught this in the classroom. They've been taught, um, they, they have the understanding of how this works, but they haven't had to apply it under pressure. And now they've got people watching. Sometimes we'll have a camera out there, a video going, and they know that, hey, they got this guy with rank role playing that they have to perform, right? So I got a, a knife to my throat and I am challenging them to use their best negotiation skills, which they're not only going to use in crisis negotiation, they're going to use in all aspects of their job and their life. And I keep it very simple, just one word, because under pressure, you can't remember complex, you know, ideas yeah. or principles, just one word. Remember these one words going around a circle and their initial response is everything we would expect. Drop the knife, drop the knife, put the knife down. I order you to drop the knife. Okay. Um, so now we're getting stuck in this circle and we'll call a timeout and say, listen, I want to introduce you to this model and to these principles. And fundamentally, your goal in this initially is not to get me to drop the knife. Your goal is to form a bond with me. And of course, we're going to make sure that tactically they're doing everything yeah. correct. We need for them to be safe, obviously. But get the mindset, your goal is to form a connection with me. Because I believe once we have that bond, once we have a connection, then we have influence. We're not influenced by strangers or people we walk by on the street because there's no relationship. So we have to build that first. And you won't believe the difference in watching these officers go from a mindset of, I need to find behavioral change right now, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife, to I need to form a connection. And I'm going to do that with understanding, timing, delivery, and respect. And we push them to follow this. And the results are incredible. All of a sudden, they're introducing themselves to me. Hi, my name is Scott. It, they're, they're doing some of that emotionally. Yeah. Like, hey, you, you sound really upset. It seems like you're having a bad day. They're asking good questions. They're being thoughtful of their delivery. And under stress, unless you're getting coaching and practice, nobody is concerned or even aware of their delivery. And the rate, the rhythm, the pressure, the volume, the tone, these are all aspects that we can change immediately. Once we give a little attention to our delivery, which is going to change the entire feel of this communication. And absolutely. And, and it's, it's great to see the results. They do incredible work and they just need the, the tools and the practice to be able to make it happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I can picture that as you, as you describe it. And for law enforcement, talking to people in crisis is very clear, right? Like it's almost every call you go on, somebody's in crisis, so you get a ton of reps. But what about our community members that aren't in law enforcement? What what would, what, who, give me an example of somebody they would talk to that would be tipped in a crisis in that setting. I think our whole world is in crisis right now. Um, I let off my TED talk in 2016 uh, with a, a line, of, something like, we're living in a, a world of crisis or people that are in crisis. I mean, that rings true still every day. I mean, we got some new crisis, wh whether it be the pandemic or politics or a natural disaster or whatever it might be, we're in crisis all the time. So I think that every person needs to be aware uh, of something that's clear to us, that there's a lot of people in our society that are in pain right now, mm -hmm. a lot of people. And a lot of people who are in pain, most of them are pretending that they're not in pain. They're pretending that everything is fine. And there's a variety of reasons that we put that mask on or give that appearance. Uh, but I think that if we can allow people to realize that if we can see beyond ourselves and start to really get to know somebody else and, and put ourselves in their shoes, I think we would have a lot more grace for the people that we're dealing with to know that. A lot of people are just simply struggling to get by in life. And, uh, you know, before we recorded today, I was listening to one of your prior episodes of a woman who had just lost her husband. Oh, yeah. And uh, you hear that and you hear the journey of everybody else. And sometimes you need to hear that. And it puts in perspective for us to say the things I'm struggling with right now might not be so bad. And when we are going through some of the things that are that bad, 
to realize there are people out there right now who are going through that same journey, who might be a little bit further down that path, who could really give me the love and support and compassion that I need to help me get through this very dark chapter in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I love what you said there and I appreciate you listening. I was Whitney uh, Lynn Allen's episode you just referenced. And uh, yes, if you haven't listened to that community, go back and make sure you listen to that one. That's a powerful story. Um, what I love, Scott, is the understanding piece and in, in your four steps. And what I want our community to realize is understanding of the position the people you are talking to are in, not your perspective, right? Just because something may not be a crisis to me based on my experience or what I've seen around the world doesn't mean it's not a crisis for them. And we yes. have to be evaluate that. And like you said, get that understanding, get them to talk to you a little bit more and you'll start picking up on, on keywords that indicate what is the crisis they're facing or what are their feelings. I, I, I think a good first step in the mindset of a crisis negotiator is it's not about you. Right. A lot of us, especially the high performing leaders kind of get conditioned that it's about you all the time. If you're posting on your social media every two minutes about what your kids are eating or pictures of you on a tropical island, it's about you all the time. And a lot of people have trouble saying this isn't about me. I at no point am going to interject what I think is right or what I think you should do. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll kind of get to that much, much further down the line once we've established some type of relationship, but it's about them. And until I can articulate your position and your interests and your feelings better than you can, I'm really not in a position where I need to be sharing my advice or what I think about you and your situation. So understanding is really about asking good questions and the skills of active listening. But in 2023, we need to go so much further than that. It's not just simply active listening because we're not doing negotiations on the phone like they used to do in the 70s. We're using Zoom all the time. I, in my career of about eight years as a negotiator with a regional team, did a few face-to-face -face negotiations, which is pretty rare and dangerous. Right. But now we can do face-to-face -face negotiations without it being so dangerous. So now that people are comfortable on Zoom and my kids who are younger are growing up being on camera, whether it be the uh, distance learning from school or just video chatting with their friends all the time, we're going to be dealing with people who are extremely comfortable being on camera. So instead of a phone call, we're going to be doing FaceTime um, negotiations or Zoom or Microsoft Teams negotiations. It's going to be some type of video chat, which means now are we drawing in um, the nonverbals? How many people out there are studying what the nonverbals tell us? Not only the body language, but the gestures and the facial expressions. And are we considering what we're wearing? and our backgrounds behind us. And that changes everything from the traditional police negotiation process into something very new. And I don't know many people who are out there really challenging these folks to say, we need to learn this. Or how about this? Are we, who out there has been trained on how to negotiate by text message? And I, I just ran a class two days ago and asked that question to a room of 30 largely negotiators and maybe one hand went up. Oh wow! How can that be? when we are going to be texting with people so basic because that's where people might be comfortable instead of picking up the phone. I don't know. They won't talk to you, but they might text with you. So yeah. maybe we got to go in that direction. Are we getting training to communicate in those mediums? So there is so much that has changed in communication over the last years and decades that we really need to make sure that if we are a high functioning team, that we are getting training and experience in all these different areas, because it's not an option for us to, to find success. Maybe in some of the business negotiations, you can walk away and say, Hey, you win some, you lose some, well, we made some money, not all the money on that one in our line of work in hostage and crisis negotiations. We don't have that luxury. We need to win every time. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about one of the things you said on the, the TED talk that I watched, that I really enjoyed was the timing. And 
kind of breaking the rhythm that we're you mentioned in our society now where we're so fast to just want to throw our thoughts right back at you that's really not a conversation it's more like just waiting my turn to throw everything at you and then you throw back and there's no listening do you have a tip on how to get people to slow down when they're in these conversations to to really be able to absorb the information and to time their opportunity to talk or to come back at a more reasonable place that allows people to feel good about their conversations? Yeah, the, the timing piece is about knowing when to deliver your message. And most fundamentally, we should be asking two questions. Number one, are you in a position where you can properly deliver the message? And here we get into a discussion about your triggers. What are your triggers? What can be done or said that's going to throw you on tilt? So I can now take control of you because you are making emotional decisions and I've got you upset. We need to get rid of that if you're going to be a good negotiator. And the second question is, are they in a position where they can hear you? Mm -hmm. We we uh, share a, a debriefing from one of our many uh, negotiations. A man was holding a woman hostage. And during the initial negotiation, we have this recording. And in the background, he's throwing up. And I asked the class the question of, why do you think he's throwing up? Is it COVID? What's got him going? And of course, everybody correctly identifies that this is a person who is so overwhelmed with stress and anxiety that he can't even control his own body. Right. So is this the time that we go for the close? We go for the sale. We try to get him to sign the contract or seal the deal. Of course not. Right. Because they're not in a position to do that. So consider the timing and in behavioral economics, they talk about system one thinking and system two thinking system one being very, very quick. This is uh, probably what keeps police officers alive in some situations. It's very instinctive and not to knock it because there's a, a place for that. Yeah. And system two thinking being much more complex and uh, and demanding and taxing on our ability to make decisions. And I'll do an exercise in my classes where I'll show the, the class a very, very quick clip of something on the screen and then ask them to describe it. And we go back to it. And it turns out that nearly the entire class misses something that's incredibly obvious. And they go back and I say, now we're going to examine this photo with system two thinking and give you more time. And they always get it right. And I said, this is what's happening in our conversations. We think we know something or I've experienced that and we put it through our lens and that's so irrelevant for the person we're speaking with. So if we hustle through and we don't take the time to listen and understand and we're saying things, not only might we not get the outcome that we're looking for, but it might put us in a worse position than we we're in to begin with. Yeah, that's powerful. It, yeah, and, and I think one of our biggest downfalls in society is we are so anxious to talk and feel like we're being heard that we fail to realize the power of conversations really in our listening. 100%. 100%. The skills of active listening are fundamental to nearly every training we do. It doesn't matter which industry. If you are trying to negotiate, you are trying to get influence, you have to have to be a great listener because your power in negotiation comes from information and options. And if you don't have information and options, you can be the smoothest talker there is, but it's not going to get you very far. No, because you'd just be guessing, right? Because you're not slowing down to get the information to strategically know what your next move is going to be. And if we can slow things down a little bit, I think we make better decisions. For anybody who wants to hit that reply all button on that email and launch <laughs> out a company-wide response because you're pissed off about something that's going to feel really good, I'm going to put you on a 24-hour emotional ignition lock. Yeah. And we're going to come back and review that the next day and think that through. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And I think um, one of the ways we we struggle in relationships is that even when we do get a chance to interact with humans, we forget that now we're talking to a human. We think we're on a computer. So we're just firing back and forth. Like we're hitting the send, send, send buttons and we're not slowing down to realize 
it's time to listen. It's time to be present. And, and I think we've all can agree. We've been in those conversations where you leave me like, okay, I don't want that to happen again. That was just a waste of my time versus others where you're like, oh, that felt good. I felt great leaving this time with this person. And I challenge you to look, what is the difference? One is both people get to speak. They get to be heard. You feel valued. The other is it's like verbal ping pong. It's just back and forth, back and forth. And then when you think you're done, you just wander off. Yeah, for any anyone in a leadership role or anyone in customer service, half your problems are going to go away if you take the time to listen to somebody. A lot of times people are just so grateful that you took the time to listen to them. And we hear that. Hey, no one's ever taken the time to listen to me. I feel better just having shared this. And sometimes that's just enough to know that you've been heard. And the person on the other side is not going to tell you that you're irrational or some crazy person out there. Not, not the case. I hear you. And what you're saying is very reasonable. And, and it's even okay to say, Hey, I might not be able to get you the outcome that you want. I'm going to do my very best to listen to everything you have to say and address any concerns that you might have. And you know, one of the other most powerful statements I've ever learned to say in my life is Scott, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Right. Instead of feeling like I have to have answers for everything that always comes up, just be honest and be okay going like, dude, I don't know what, but will you tell me, maybe you got a better thought than I do. I might not be able to help, but I'm so glad that you shared this with me. Please tell me more. <laughs> there open you go. that door, open that door to dialogue. Our goal yeah. is to create a dialogue with somebody and get them talking. Yeah. Absolutely. And the final step you have there is respect. Talk us through that. What do you, what do you mean by respect? Well, I think that most people understand the respect piece and that it's good to be respectful. Yes, please. No, thank you. Yes, sir. No, ma'am types of things. Um, but for me, respect goes a little bit deeper. Respect is about emotion and understanding how people make decisions. And if you think back to a time that you were disrespected, you don't conclude this after a, a thoughtful analysis using logic and reason. You immediately know it because that's driven by emotion. So respect is about emotion. And what are the drivers of human behavior? And some, some different groups talk about what they feel the biggest drivers of human behavior are. Um, I think fairness is a big one. People really like to be treated fairly. I think right now coming out of the pandemic years, autonomy is a huge driver of human behavior. People want the freedoms that we used to have. We, you have generations of people who never experienced anything like you can't go to the rest and the freedoms that we enjoyed are gone. And a lot of people are really um, desiring the autonomy or the autonomy to work from home that you have people who say, I won't go into the office anymore. I want the freedom. I should have the freedom. So autonomy is a huge driver of human behavior. And I think the old school mindset of the high pressure sale, don't let them leave until we get them to agree to it, man, that is really not going to work. It's going to cause real confrontation because where authority may have been a huge driver uh, of human behavior in the past, at least in my experience, the uh, the authority piece has really been diminished. And you see that in all aspects of life, the, particularly in, in law enforcement. But look at airplanes. I mean, when have we ever seen viral videos of people losing their mind on airplanes and refusing the direction of the, the captain of the plane or the flight attendants or at uh, sports games where referees have have less authority? That That's becoming diminished a bit from how it used to be. So a good understanding of what's driving behavior, empathy, are, are we connecting with people? That's a big one. And if we can touch on the things that drive behavior, and uh, there's a great book out there called Beyond Reason, Using Emotions as You Negotiate. Dan Shapiro, one of my favorite Harvard professors, is a co-author of that one. He talks about the five core concerns that we all have. And are we touching on these and using these emotions in the right way? I think that we have to have a good understanding of how people make decisions, where they come from, and how we're able to nudge those um, drivers in the right direction to get the results that we want. 
man, I, I love it. I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think it's, it's pretty awesome that this Ted talk you did back in 2016 is still as a uh, timely and purposeful today as it was back then, Scott. Yeah. Wild. Um, I wish it wasn't. I wish that we didn't live in a world where people were in crisis. I, I wish that we didn't need the skills of conflict resolution and de-escalation. But not only do we need that in law enforcement, but we need that in so many industries across the U.S. and across the world that it still continues to be relevant. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I agree with you. And I'm thankful that you had a couple things, Scott. One, you had the recognition to realize you have a unique set of skills. And two, you had the courage to step out on your own to deliver it to a broader audience. So I want to thank you for doing that. And then thirdly, I want to thank you for taking time out of your days to to join our On Purpose community. Thanks for leading the discussion and continuing to have the podcast. I think that once we connect people with their purpose, they can live a more meaningful life and everything they do funnels toward that purpose. So I love what you're doing. I love the discussions that you're having and, you know, continue to uh, support you and your work. I appreciate it, Scott. Where can our audience uh, follow along with you and be part of your network? Sure. Um, first of all, I'd love to connect with anybody personally on LinkedIn. I'm very active on that social media platform. So if you're there, let's connect. If you're not there, get there. You can network with global professionals, leaders of your industry, wherever you're from. Uh, but also you can check out my website, scotttillema.com or uh, my company, negotiationscollective.com. Meet some uh, terrific negotiators and some uh, amazing people that are part of my team. Scott, thanks again for joining us. And uh, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for having me on. Take care. And remember, team, life is far too short to live any other way than on purpose. We'll see you all again next week.